So today we're here at Colossal Cave in Tucson, Arizona. Out here in the beautiful nature, the mountainside, saguaro cactuses, ocotillo bushes, beaver tail cactus, or prickly pear, most people call it. See all the red berries on them? You can actually make those into jellies. They're really good. Plus all the desert animals eat them. Desert tortoises eat those berries all the time. Those fruits. They wait till they're ripe and they fall, hit the ground, and then they just come and chew them all up and their mouth gets stained red. It's pretty funny. Anyhow, we're here with uh, my wife and Brock and Kaylee. And we're gonna go explore Colossal Cave. Let's do it. There's the, what? Yeah, a lot of people do this. They make art out of the dead saguaro ribs. Yeah, the saguaro ribs are protected. You're not allowed to go out into the desert and dig them up and stuff. If they're on your property, you get to keep them, but you can't go and harvest them. That one's really cool looking. This is a historic place. Look at that. In 1934. Mommy's in the gift shop going to get some tickets. And we're going to walk down some stairs and see what's over here. You think the cave's this way? Yeah. Where do you think the cave is? Why don't you go explore? There's a close up of a saguaro cactus right there. This one's very tall, grown right into the side of the mountain. Obviously they placed the rocks around it and left it here. But it's a very, very old saguaro. Alright, we just left the, uh, the gift shop. We got our tickets. How much was the tickets? Eighteen for adult, nine for kid, for a total of fifty-seven thirty with tax. So here's the entrance to the cave, colossal cave. It says honoring some pioneers, the foresight, and untiring effort preserved this beauty spot for posterity. <laughs> June 28, 1955. Look at the cactus growing right outside the rocks, babe. The cactus right there is just growing right outside the the, uh, the face of the rocks. There's a little barrel cactus up there with the flowers on it. Pretty cool. Here's a wooden map of the place. So right over here is the entrance where we're going in. And then all of the white corridors here are areas of the cave that we can go to. There's a great room way to the back there, the Grotto of the Lost Treasures, Hall of Time. There's supposed to be, uh, there's supposed to be a hidden treasure inside of this place. They'll tell us more about it. But some old bank robbers or something had some money that they were running away from people and came up here and hid it inside the cave somewhere so if you find it you get to keep it if I remember right right here in front of me is some strange strange cactus it's covered in some kind of weird hair no it's not a jumping cactus it looks like a miniature saguaro cactus. But I know what that it's may be. It's got all this weird hair on it, though. 
really, really coarse. Careful, there's needles right there. Don't touch I the get, needles. I felt, I get poked. Like Look at those little things over there. Oh, those are cats. Here we go. Can we use a flashlight too? Yeah, absolutely. Alright, as soon as we get down to the bottom of these stairs right here, we'll, I'll give you your flashlight, okay? Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate it. Watch your head, folks. <laughs> All right, stopping right here. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Watch your head, everybody. Look around. All right. Have a nice little rest of the next week. All right, guys. We made notice the lovely smell that we have here in this first room. We have a group of over 30 Kiwatis or Kotamundi to live here inside of the cave. They're part of the raccoon family. They've got a longer snout and a longer tail than a raccoon, and they sleep on the shelf up there to your right. There aren't any up there right now, unfortunately. They're fed elsewhere from recently, so they have eaten them into the cave now. But they do believe on them being found in this first room, as we've noticed. Um, those Kotamundis are omnivores. See many of the scorpions and tarantulas in the area. They love getting into our trash cans as well, so we have to keep an eye on those. They've also made their way into our margarita machines a few times, so we have to stop on top of those. What are those things they put over the light? Is that like 
Did fiberglass. Fiberglass, yeah. yeah. They kind of went in with the natural <laughs> Look at the roof up here, buddy. Just watch your left shoulder as you guys set up these stairs. I can see some of them have broken off. Lots of them. guys so we call this room the crystal forest named for all the beautiful crystal formations overhead these crystals aren't bright and shining like you might have been expecting and that's because our cave is a dry dormant cave so water no longer actively runs through it it's been drying out for the past 10 to 12,000 years and over that time a really thick layer of dirt or debris has accumulated and so it covers all the calcite crystals here inside of our cave when this was a live cave, water would find its way through the limestone, drip through the cracks in the ceiling, and leave calcite deposits like these. These are stalactites. I remember that because they hang on tight to the ceiling. You can see how many of them are broken off already, and that's a result of the tourism that occurred here in the late 1800s. This never happens naturally, so if you see one that's broken off, it had to been broken off by a person at some point. Today, it's actually a federal offense to do any damage to the cave or even take tiny pebbles out, punishable anywhere from a $700 fine to two years in prison. So they take cave conservation really seriously nowadays. When this was a live cave, water would drip off the tip of those stalactites onto the ground, and it would then form stalagmite like this one right here in front of me. You might trip over a stalagmite, that's why I remember that. And you may notice that I've broken our biggest rule. Don't tell my boss, okay? So this is Old Baldy. People have been rubbing Old Baldy for good luck for a very long time, as you can see. So I should recommend it if you're on the taller side so you don't bug your head today on the tour. Since everyone likes to rub Old Baldy for good luck, the protective dirt layer that was on top of the calcite crystal is gone. So you can see the exposed crystal underneath. Really smooth, really beautiful, and also really bad for that formation when you touch it because we have all those oils and dirts that are on our hands. They stay on top of the surface and create almost a rain barrier. If this were to become a live cave again, water would drip from the ceiling and just roll off of the surface. It makes it unable to grow anymore, so that's considered a dead formation. This is our one and only exception that no touch rules. So you guys can all get it out of your system here. Do walk by this rubble body for good luck. And as you guys do that, I like to point out this column. It's where a slag tight and a slag might reach and go together. We've got a pretty large column on the right side, and you'll see some smaller ones on your left as well. Touched old Baldy. <laughs> Here, hold the handrail, buddy. This one, Brock, right above your head. <laughs> but a lot of water was stripping off that one. <laughs> so as you guys make your way down to the bottom of the stairs here, just look up to the right and you'll see a really beautiful picture spot. We call this the Kingdom of the Elves. You might have to use your imagination a little bit when you look at it, but the top part kind of looks like a castle, and all the stalagmites underneath look like an army of elves marching up to that castle. And as you guys come around, I always like to point out the formation right here over my head. So this is Mr. Fang. Fang is the largest stalactite in our cube system. He was in around one ton, so he's not going to budge, and he's known for taking out tall people's foreheads. At the bottom of Fang, there's some darker distillation, and that's from all the hair products over the years. So my taller folks, please watch your head coming down this step. Also watch your head uh, going up the next set of stairs. All right. I don't want to get bit by the Fang. Look at how sparkly this rock is next to us, the, the whole side of the wall. It's beautiful. Ooh. 
Ooh. This is a really big room. So this room is one of the largest in our cave system. We call it the drapery room, and it gets its name from these drapery formations up here. Similar to the stalactite, water made its way through the limestone up here. Instead of being pointed, these formed in really thin sheets. So when the water came through, the surface tension was pretty high. The water would stay along the wall and up a layer of calcite. On top of that, another layer of calcite formed until eventually you get these thin sheets called draperies or curtains. In between those draperies, you can see halectite, so the smaller, pointier calcite deposits right there in between. If you stand right underneath and look upward, they kind of look like alligator teeth in between those draperies, so you can try that if you guys would like to. And geologists are still debating to this day exactly how these are formed. They tend to defy gravity by the way they go upward and every which direction you can see. They're not totally sure how the water that forms them is able to do that. Before we move on, I do get a lot of questions about our lights, like this one right here. We call these our stalag lights. They're made out of fiberglass. They're not real rocks by any means. So if you have to touch something outside the cave system, you can touch these fiberglass coverings. It's perfectly fine. And if you want to get a closer look over here, you're more than welcome to do so. <laughs> so this is a passageway that was used by the Civilian Conservation Corps. They'd use these areas to bring in the supplies, like the flagstone flooring we're all standing on, as well as these railings. There's about three and a half miles of passageway total that runs throughout the cave system. We still go exploring through these passageways today on our level two ladder tours, as well as our intermediate and advanced wild cave tours. And on the right side, you'll see a metal body basket with some, with some first aid kits with green lettering. Those are actually Cold War era. The cave was prepped to be a fallout shelter here during the Cold War, and these have been here ever since. There is a rule that's followed among many caves all over the world. Usually states that if an object has been left inside of a cave for more than 50 years, it's deemed historic and you're not allowed to remove it. So over time, these have fallen under that rule. There's trash in the parts of the cave we can't take out today because it's considered historic, so it just stays here forever. <laughs> And if you look at these formations here, you'll see some landmarks. So early explorers try to find these kinds of formations. Just remember where they were in the cave or how to get out. First, you're looking at the cave witch. So there's her big wart, her eye, her big witchy nose, her big tooth. And her mouth is wide open because she's eating a limestone cookie. You can see her hair on the right side, too. She's also got a pet cat named Shadow here to keep her company. <laughs> a lot of people think Shadow looks like Batman too, it's up to you. <laughs> On the right side, you guys will see Mr. Magoo. There's his big round nose, and he's sipping a cup of coffee. <laughs> so if people were ever lost inside the cave system, they'd always try to find the cave witch because her nose points the way back out to the cave entrance. So she is a good witch. <laughs> We do have a legend here that in the late 1800s, there were bandits in the area. There were particular three of them called the Santano Gang, and they were train robbers. They stole anywhere from $2,000 to $72,000 worth of gold and silver from Wells Fargo. When they stole all that money, they came here to the cave to hide away from the sheriff. They were good friends with Solomon Lick, the man that was letting everyone come in and vandalizing everything. He was bringing them food and water and such, so they were able to survive for about a three and a half week duration. The sheriff, on the other hand, was waiting for those bandits to come out. I think he thought he came through. He thought that was the only way to come in and out of the cave, so he figured he would just wait it out, and eventually they would come back out of that same entrance. But they found this little tunnel right here. So they crawled for about three minutes, stood up, walked another 20. They were out on the opposite side of the mountain, about a quarter of a mile away. And once they got out of the cave, they decided to go to the next town over, and naturally they started bragging about how they didn't run the sheriff, of course, word got around, eventually he heard about that. As you can imagine, he wasn't very happy, so he found the bandits eventually. When he found them, there was a really big shootout. Two of them died and the other one was arrested. But the money that they stole was never found, so people think that it's still lost somewhere here inside the cave system today. Which is growing outside. <coughs> the next
next room that you're going into, I'm actually going to send you in by yourselves because it loops right back around into this room, so there's no way you can get lost. It's called the Great Fault Room. It's called the Great Fault Room because of the large boulder overhead. So this is a slip fault. At some point, this boulder slips 20 feet between a fault line and it's stayed lodged here ever since. When you're in the Great Fault Room, just take a look overhead because you'll see how the same boulder continues on all the way through into that fault and bridges. When you're in that room, also take a look over the railing to see what the natural cave floor looks like. Lots of these large rocks, they're really jagged. That's what you would have been climbing over in Frank Schmidt's tours during the 20s and 30s. We still go free climbing through there today on our wild cave tours as well. When you guys go down the stairs, there's no railings. The steps are steep and narrow, so if you have to touch sidewalls that's alright in that area, if you can get away with not touching them, then don't. So you guys can start heading on the right side there. Just watch your head and your shoulder. Do you want to go with mommy? Excuse me. Mommy's right there. Ooh, it's so tight right here. Watch your head. Whoa, that looks awesome, huh? Where's the big rock that fell? There it is. Do you have your light? Look at the flashing. The water used to go through here. Sorry, we're holding up the line. Glow shoes. You want to touch the fiberglass light? She said you could touch those. Maybe we'll find one up here that intrigues you. <laughs> Do you remember what those are called, Brock? The ones hanging from the roof? Yeah. Yeah? You just want me to take your word or you want to tell me? Almost looks fake. Yeah. Ooh. It looks like a dinosaur. Oh no. Lots of vandalism in here. Watch your feet behind you, Kate. Don't fall off the cliff.
We call this room the living room, uh, more specifically Frank Schmidt's living room. That gift shop, the building that you checked into before the tour, that's where Frank Schmidt used to live. When he lived there, he didn't have air conditioning, so if he could, he'd much rather be down here, especially during those hot summer months. He would spend six or seven days at a time right here in this area, usually mapping out the cave. And the people that were taking his tours, if they wanted to take a little break or even a nap, they would just roll up his sleeping bags right here and get some rest. So this was a really well used area, especially during the 20s and 30s. Um, if I were to shine my light directly across me, I don't want to blind anyone over there, so I'm not going to. There's lots of rocks there, and they don't look like much, but they're actually the bottom of a 30-foot sinkhole, and we're working our way up to the top of that sinkhole by the end of the tour. At the top of the sinkhole, we'll see a large boulder. Frank Schmidt ties rope around that boulder, and he'd lower down extra supplies like ropes and candles, so if people needed to replenish, they could do so pretty easily right over there. If he wanted to take the shortcut down here to his living room, he ties rope around that same boulder and climbed down the 30-foot wall in complete darkness. He couldn't have a carbide lantern with a flame running on his forehead because it would burn the rope in front of his face, and it was also before the CCC put in the lighting. However, he loved embellishing and telling tall tales, so a lot of people think he'd have a lantern and he just lowered down beforehand. He'd have some form of light guiding him down that wall. Soon after that, we have a different manager named uh, Manny Joe Meyerhauser. He actually used this room as, uh, for poker nights every Saturday. Saturday night, so a lot of people call it Joe's Man Cave as well, so just another good area. <laughs> Um, in that middle section of the flooring, um, if you guys are standing there with an the area with the sandpaper across it, um, if you want to move your feet around a little bit just to see how slippery that is, that's another good look at the natural cave floor. Just 95 years worth of people walking over it makes it really smooth and really slick. We actually call that cave ice. We're also at the lowest or deepest point of the cave that we'll go today, which is technically over here behind me. We're about six stories underneath the parking lot right now, so your car is somewhere overhead. The deepest point overall is about 80 feet underground. As you walk through this next area here, just watch your head and your shoulders. We have a formation in the next room. It's on the right side. We call it the Bone Crusher. You can't miss it. There was a tour guide a few years back. He was walking backwards, talking to his tour group. He turned around just in time to break his nose on that formation, oh. so just watch over the Bone Crusher on your right. <laughs> Look at this. Wow. It looks like really big baldy. I found it. <laughs> Look at this thing, Brock. Yes, so this is the one pressure. Like I said, oh, it's hard to miss this. Watch your face on it, guys. Watch your head, shoulders, <laughs> knees, and toes. Go ahead. Keep going, buddy. This is really cool. What, buddy? You can see under there. Just watch your right shoulder coming up these stairs and your head. Some of the rocks over here are kind of sparkly. So as you guys approach the top here, there's this hole overhead. Um, so that's a construction shaft that was built by the Civilian Conservation Corps. They just used this to come in and out of the cave a little bit more efficiently. When you're leaving the parking lot today, look to the left of the exit sign. You're going to see a small brown building that almost looks like a doghouse in the ground. And that's where the shaft exits about 30 feet up to the surface. We don't use this anymore today. We've actually blocked it off just in case people try to sneak in. It's really unstable. If somebody were to stand on that ladder there at the bottom, it would probably collapse in on them. And a lot of people ask if we've used this for mining. So in 1907, there were seven train car loads of something mined out of here. Do you guys have any guesses as to what they might have mined out of here? Mm, copper. That's like our number one guess, but it wasn't copper. Silver. 
Guano. Guano. Yep, that's right. Back poop or back guano. So I have a green car load that a year. Uh, they used it in their gunpowder and fertilizer back then, and there was plenty of it here. Other than that, they never mined anything else out. <laughs> Almost looks like webs on the bottom of some of these rocks. Yeah, it's called box work. They're just those, those really jagged lines. Yeah, that's the iron's like embedded into it. That's what gives it those jagged looks. It looks wet right there. Cool looking. So as you approach the top of the stairs, you're going to see another really neat formation. It's the silent waterfall. Some like the stalactites, but instead of being pointed at the bottom, there's just different layers of limestone rock, and all these different layers make it look just like a waterfall. Looking overhead, you'll see some really good examples of how about 15 million years ago, this cave was completely underwater. There was a hot springs that rose from the ground up, and the water within the hot springs carried a sulfuric acid. That sulfuric acid ate away to limestone, limestone, which naturally created all these different shapes, as well as all the pathways that we've been walking through today. So this cave was really carved out by water. If you use your imagination, you might be able to see the dinosaur boneyard. There are no actual dinosaur bones here, but these formations do look pretty realistic. You might be able to see a vertebrate on the right, pelvic bone in the middle, and parts of a rib cage on the left. See the bones, Brock? I think so. down these stairs here they're a bit steep and narrow a lot of people like to sidestep on the way down also watch your head at the bottom we've got a pretty low hanging formation here It's very deep. Just make sure you guys watch your head as we come into this next room. Yeah. It's a very deep hole. Way down. Yeah, if you guys want to come with the doctor, that's perfect. Come on. Hold on tight. Yeah, stone. Yeah, um, that's calcite. So, um, do you remember Old Baldy? Yeah. Yeah. So, same uh, type of formation. That's optical. Old Baldy's fluorescent. So, yellow and white basically is the difference that that is. That just undergoes higher pressure and heat. That's so prettier and more sparkly. <laughs> Almost looks like ice. 
diamonds in here? No, I wish. <laughs> wrong, wrong ice. <laughs> There's an untouched stalactite. <laughs> so this is the sinkhole that I had talked about earlier when we were in Frank's living room. If you look, you can actually see Frank's living room. You can see some of the flooring there that we walked on not too long ago. And then right up here, this is the boulder that Frank Schmidt tied his rope around. Like I said, if you wanted to lower down extra supplies or take that shortcut, you'd do so right about here. On those wild cave tours, we still utilize this area. So the intermediate is about three and a half hours long and the advanced is five hours long. So we're doing proper caving in here, lots of climbing and crawling. But we climb over all of these rocks and without a rope, we climb up the wall here onto the balcony. Sounds really scary, but there's many different shelves and handholds you can see. So it's a bit less intimidating from the bottom than it is from here for sure. I also like to talk about our bats in this area. So I don't know if you guys have seen any flying around today. We've got about seven different species and a hundred of each at the peak of bat season, which is April to October. So quite a few bats here, five of which are insectivores, the other two are nectar feeding bats. One of our insectivore species is a myotis bat. It's about the size of your thumb and it can eat over 600 mosquitoes in just under an hour. So they're pretty impressive, yeah. The largest species that we have is a, a pallid bat. It's about the size of your hand. They eat larger insects like uh, centipedes and sometimes scorpions as well. So this is the last stop in our tour today. Everybody is more than welcome to come here onto the balcony, take pictures and whatnot. Make sure you watch out for the cave ice on the right. It's a bit slippery, so just hang onto the railing if you need to. Have a really good grip on your phones and cameras. People drop them here sometimes. They don't usually work after that, so just keep that in mind. I'll be waiting at the top of the stairs up there. Do you folks have any questions for me before we start to move on? Does water drip through here at all? Uh, every 20 to 30 years when we get like a really heavy monsoon season, there's one small room where you get pinhead sized droplets, if that. So other than that, there's no water in here. Um, since we're so high up on the mountain, whenever we have like a large influx, it just pulls down at the bottom. It doesn't really have enough time to come through the fall lines anymore. Any other questions? Alrighty guys, like I said, you can take pictures here and I'll just be waiting at the top of the stairs. As we make our way back out, just get uh, get ready for the temperature difference. It's going to be a bit warmer outside than it is in here. Also, get ready for the light difference. Your eyes need some time to adjust to the brightness. If you have sunglasses, I recommend putting those on right before you get out. <coughs> We're passing old Baldy on the left side this time, so if you'd like to rip old Baldy for good luck, go right ahead. You're going to rub it again? Yeah. All right, here we go. <laughs> Got it. No. You're going to be lucky all day. Yeah. All Yay. <laughs> All right, stay right here. We made it. Thank goodness it's cloudy. It is. Thank you guys for coming out today. All right. Now we're in the gift shop, Colossal Cave gift shop, where we bought our tickets. Lots of beautiful rocks, and books about the area. Bookends and crystal necklaces and dream catcher necklaces and even camping stuff. These are all really cool. Lamps. Crystal. Yeah, there's spirals and towers.
Lots of cool gifts for kids, big kids, and old people. <laughs> All right, so we just finished our our tour of Colossal Cave. I haven't been in there in like several years, like at least 20 years, 25 years. But we brought the little kids for the first time. What did you find? Put it up here on the rock so I can look at it. <laughs> Why are you picking up a wasp? You found a dead wasp? Yes. Go ahead. We just finished our tour of Colossal Cave. And it was a really, really cool place. I haven't been down there in quite a long time. There's some more cactus growing out of the side of the wall. This desert is a pretty harsh area. Things survive wherever they can. There's a saguaro that I saw earlier. Just growing out of the side of the rock. And this place has been here since the 1800s, so it's probably an original saguaro not put there on purpose just it grew there all right so we did some exploring everybody now we're gonna head back to the car and go home and maybe go eat lunch eat. <laughs> yeah we need to get out of here though because the storm right up there through the trees looks pretty dark out coming over the mountain range and it usually comes pretty quick so we need to get out of here. This place is pretty neat, pretty historic too. I didn't realize it was such an old attraction for the area. But they were saying like 1800s, right? 1880s? Yeah. That people, the ranch owner down here was bringing guests into. Here's another quick view of the valley. It really is very scenic. Lovely to visit, but unfortunately, we live here. Anyhow. Yep, can't get away from it. Yep. It's raining. As I thought, the rain is coming. It's just starting to rain, so we're going to scurry to the car. <laughs> There's an overview of the entire complex built way back in the day, early 30s. And the mountains smell the saguaro cactuses and the storm rolling overhead. Might be some lightning soon. We already heard some thunder, so we got to get going. <laughs> 